Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are on this planet, and welcome to a very special SETI Byte. Today we're going to talk about Dyson Sphere, and for this I invited Lawrence Gro. Hi, Lauren. Hi. Lauren is our Outreach Manager for Laser City. We're going to talk more about that. And this is, is <laughs> Dr. Franck Machis. He is a Senior Planetary Astronomer and Director of Citizen Science with Unistellar at the SETI Institute. Okay, so Dyson Sphere. Did we find aliens? Well, first I need you to tell me what a Dyson Sphere is. So we did not find aliens. Well, more will be revealed. All right, tell me what the Dyson Sphere is. So a Dyson Sphere was first thought of in the 1960s. And this is essentially a megastructure around a star built by aliens. So essentially the idea is that an alien civilization would be advanced enough so that it would try to harness additional energy from the host star in the planetary system that it's in. And a giant structure, whatever that's made of, I'm not 100% sure, but it would be built around the star in order to harness energy from it for the alien civilization to use. Okay, so it's not really a sphere. A, no. The name is wrong. It's kind of a mega structure around the star. Right. And it's a theoretical idea. We have not yet found Dyson Sphere. Correct. But we believe that if an alien civilization has evolved, it may be able to build this kind of stuff. Exactly. Okay. So, two papers was published uh, last week or two weeks ago, and uh, they report uh, some kind of anomalies mm -hmm. on stars. And you kind of the, the big master of stars here. You know everything about stars. You did uh, your PhD on stars. I did do my PhD on stars. So, <laughs> tell us, what exactly did they do? So, there's a couple of things that may indicate the presence of a Dyson sphere, at least we, we think. Um, one of those things is that First of all, a Dyson sphere, we, at least in my mind, I imagine something that's of course not solid because that would block out the entire star, but maybe something with lots of parts to it, mm -hmm. and it may affect the optical light coming from the star. Another thing is that whatever material these Dyson spheres are made of is going to absorb light from the star and then emit back in the infrared or mid-infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum as heat. So it's going to take in that energy, but there's going to be some heat waste, essentially. And so what these people are doing is looking for extra infrared light, what we call infrared excess in the astronomical community. So um, the way they did that is by not looking each star one by one. because they That would take a lot of time. Yeah, five million of them. It's a lot. They basically use what people have been done in the past have been doing in the past, so they observe using su catalog surveys, basically. Correct. Um, they use Tumas, um, uh -huh. Gaia, and WISE. Wise. We're not going to go through the details, but it's sure. basically observing invisible, near-infrared, and mid-infrared. Mid right. And with Gaia, you also have the distance of mm -hmm. the stars. So there is two papers. One of them is Project Ephaistos, and it was published by uh, Matthias Suasso and his team. And in this um, analysis, um, what did they discover? So they actually discovered several candidates. And again, that's kind of the, the kicker, right? Like you said, did we discover Dyson spheres? Well, we don't really know because we can't go touch one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but they did find several candidates. I think they found seven in total. And they all happened to be around M dwarfs, which are, you may hear them called red dwarfs, but these are the most common stars uh, in the universe. Um, so we've got seven candidates from this first paper. Yeah, and those candidates are relatively close to us, that less than 1,000 light years away from us. Right. Um, so the size of the galaxy is 100,000 light years, just to give you an idea. So it's very close. And, and the detection, the excess, is not marginal. It's a clear detection. It's like 60 times or something like this. Correct. The expected... Uh, 60 times uh, brighter in the infrared that you expect from those stars. Exactly. So with any star, we can essentially model what it should look like in each different wavelength regime of light. And so what these people are seeing is that based on the type of star that they know that it is, it's much, much, much brighter in the mid-infrared than they would expect it to be if it was only the star itself present. Yeah. 
So if you want to know more about how they do that, I recommend you look at the paper. We're going to put the link on this uh, video. Uh, they use neural network to do the analysis that are validated by uh, you using humans. You have done that for your PhD, Oh, right? God, yes. I spent many, many hours validating so, as a human. Okay. <laughs> it was a lot. And from this excess, they derive that the temperature of this mega structure, if they exist, will be 25 degrees Celsius. So it's temperature of like uh, of, that we can survive, and it will cover only 60% of the stars. So that's uh, that's not a sphere, but that's a significant portion of the star, which is basically covered by this mega structure. Right. And there is a second paper. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about this one? Um, so this other paper, which we won't go too deeply into, but it looked at stars a much farther distance away from us. I think within 6,500 light years away. Um, so it looked at a lot more stars, and I believe they found around 60, 60. candidates. Um, so this this paper that we're talking about first is you know a, a smaller search, a smaller number of candidates, and and the other one uses the same idea we're still looking for infrared excess um but a, a different methodology to get there in a different search radius that's kind of surprising that two papers published almost at the same time getting the same result do we have an explanation for that or is it pure i don't coincidence? know actually it, you know i mean i don't know if there's like speakings in the astronomical community about what's going on i don't know if it's a coincidence um but i don't think that the two teams are linked okay we will investigate that so they found Dyson Sphere, maybe, okay? But there's tons of other explanation. Right. Okay, let's go through the other natural explanation for this kind of uh, yeah. excess. So one of them, and this is what I did my uh, PhD research on, is circumstellar disks. So a circumstellar disk, um, particularly a, a debris disk, for instance, which we have in our own solar system, so think of the asteroid belt, the Kuiper belt, this is basically debris left over from planetary formation. Um, and that contains a lot of dust and planetesimals. Um, and that also would absorb heat from a star and then re-radiate in the infrared. So circumstellar disks, which we often search for, um, they're signposts of planetary formation, so we look for them a lot in order to study you know, planetary evolution. Um, they also emit infrared excess. And so the signatures are very, very similar. Um, however, this really, really large amount of infrared excess is a is kind of a particular thing. So this can happen naturally, especially if there's a really, really young star um, and it's starting, it's just starting to, to form uh, planets. You may see a, a t really large amount of infrared excess um, or there could be giant collisions between yeah. planets or asteroids or, or whatever that's causing like a huge, very temporary um, amount of infrared excess. Uh, but this is a little bit different because those particular scenarios, we, we either know how to identify them because the star is really, really young, or that infrared excess is so large that, okay, well, it has to be, uh, you know, this collision type event. Um, so this is a little bit different because a lot of these stars are old. Yeah. So they're not those young planetary systems forming. So yeah. another explanation could be that there is something in the background of the star, right. which is emitting uh, infrared light. Yes. So that could be a galaxy that is very bright in infrared, and the telescopes or the detector basically have not, cannot distinguish between the star and the background object. But in this case, since those objects are relatively close, if you observe them again in two, five, ten years, they will move away from this background object, so we will we will see we will not see any more this uh, excess in the infrared. Exactly. So there could be some follow up studies on these particular candidates. Yeah, and then there is some more exotic explanation, but I'm not going to go through that because it's not really my field. Such as some kind of weird interaction on the surface of the star, sure. and some dust falling onto the onto the photosphere and so on. So there is still a mystery. Mm -hmm. How are we going to fix? How are we going to solve this mystery? Oh man, um, how are we going to solve this mystery? So, as always with astronomy, more data is we needed. We need more data. <laughs> we need more data. <laughs> we need more telescope time. Um, so one of those particular observations could be JWST observations in the future. The James Webb Space Telescope. Exactly. Thank you. So what? So you tell me, what do you think that JWST? If we were to look at these with JWST. What do you think would be a signpost for, you know, hey, maybe this is actually a Dyson sphere uh, uh, in those JWST observations? 
The JWST is a great instrument to do spectroscopy in the, in the mid infrared and near infrared. So it's going to be interesting to see if there is any signatures on the spectrum of those stars in the excess that could suggest an artificial uh, material to create this structure right. or confirm whether or not it's by, for instance, a background galaxy. Sure. We will clearly see that quickly by looking at the spectrum in the mid and near infrared. Right. So that's the first step. Uh, JWST is a very demanded uh, telescope. I mean, <laughs> yes. a lot of people want to observe uh, with the JWST and there is a lot of stars. So I'm hoping the team or others already asked for telescope time so we confirm or at least have a spectrum of some of those stars. Yeah. And then let's assume it's a Dyson sphere. Let's okay. assume we are clearly seeing um, um, an extraterrestrial advanced civilization. Okay. We have another way to confirm that. What could we do? What could we do? So uh, we can always observe with other telescopes in other wavelengths. So radio, for instance. So you were telling me that the ATA could observe these stars. He's doing it right now. There you go. The ATA is obser observing these stars now. So there's the a radio Allen signal. The Telescope Array. Yes, we're using a lot <laughs> of acronyms because astronomers really love acronyms. But the Allen Telescope Array, aka the ATA, um, is observing these stars. So if there's a radio signal that is anomalous and different from what we're, you know, producing on Earth, we may actually see something. So the idea is that if an advanced civilization can create a Dyson sphere, they can obviously do a lot more. Mm -hmm. So that they may be emitted, emitting uh, communications in the radio or even uh, through lasers. Lasers? Yes. So people are lasers. looking for laser, for laser civilization using lasers? Yes. So you've brought me to a wonderful point. Um, <laughs> the laser study is an it is another kind of aspect of the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, and the idea behind laser study is that these, a laser, if you know what a laser is, is a monochromatic source of light, and these don't occur in nature. So it's a little bit different than maybe looking for the radio where we have a whole, or looking in the radio where we have a whole ton of, you know, inter interference from yeah, things. Yeah, natural phenomena. Exactly, natural phenomenon. Those there's no natural phenomenons creating optical lasers in space that we know about. Um, so looking for lasers in space would be a really great way to identify advanced civilizations. We could search for those on these candidates. Yeah. So the, uh, what we, we designing instruments to do this kind of, uh, of uh, search. Uh, Laser City is at the City Institute. It was basically um, designed by Elliot Gillum. Mm -hmm. And uh, what you have in the back here, those are laser city stations. We are building them now here. And uh, the goal is to have 10 of them, even more, 14 of them, covering the entire northern hemisphere and capable of detecting these uh, laser pearls, uh, in the, suggesting the existence of this alien civilization. What we're going to probably do is to look in our database to search for those stars and see if there is in the direction of those stars with potentially a Dyson sphere uh, a detection of a flash of a laser. Yeah. Maybe there is aliens in this database. That would be cool. And it would be great, especially if, you know, that JWST time, maybe it takes a while. Yeah. These are things we can do right now. Okay, so what's the, what's, how are we going to conclude that? We did not find aliens yet. I don't think we found aliens yet, conclusively. But more will be revealed. And we found something super cool and super interesting. So stay tuned and... Uh, See you soon for another video. Thank you. Bye. Bye.